Canada will fall short of its pledge to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2020. A new report from the Ecofiscal Commission says it's time to restructure Canada's policies and start effectively pricing pollution through carbon pricing tools. Joining us now for more on these tools and what they would deliver to the environment, the economy and Canadians in Vancouver, British Columbia, Kenneth Green, Senior Director of the Centre for Natural Resources at the Fraser Institute. And with us here in studio, Chris Reagan, Chair of the Ecofiscal Commission and Professor of Economics at McGill University. Peter Victor, an economist and Professor of Environmental Studies at York University. And Celine Back, CEO of Analytica Advisors. And we are happy to have everybody back here at TVO. Ken Green, good to have you on the program as well from Vancouver. I want to start just, uh, Chris Reagan, with you, because I think we need to know more about this Ecofiscal Commission that you're chairing. And I note um, you've got quite a cast of characters who are a part of this thing. Uh, all political parties represented, uh, former PM Paul Martin, Liberal, Mike Harcourt is a former NDP Premier of British Columbia, Jean Charest is a former leader of the Conservative Party, Preston Manning, the founder of the Reform Party, I think Bob Ray's in there as an advisor, who's both Liberal and NDP, you've got a lot of parties uh, covered. Uh, the CEO of the David Suzuki Foundation is there, the CEO of Suncor Energy is there. Anyway, why has this group come together like this? Uh, so we launched, the Ecofiscal Commission launched in November, uh, and what brings us together, uh, and, you know, the, the, there's 12 economists who are from across the country, and then the, the names that you were listing are our advisory group. Uh, and these people have come together with a shared conviction that Canada can do better, it can do a lot better in terms of both economic performance and environmental performance, and that those two things really come together, and that if you uh, think carefully about redesigning our fiscal structures across the country uh, by attaching prices to pollution so we can reduce uh, the incentives to pollute, and at the same time, uh, use those revenues to recycle back into the economy to generate economic benefits. We can get both environmental benefits and economic benefits at the same time if we do it right. You know that's what we're all about. That's what you're about. You know lots of people don't think that's possible, right? That one comes at the expense of another. You're here to refute that. I, I, would, I would say that that idea that these two things uh, are trade-offs is the number one obstacle that we, uh, that we are arguing against. Uh, and I think people are coming around. Who created you? It's an the creation question. Interesting. Um, we have come together ourselves. Uh, we are not connected to any government. We are fully independent. Uh, we're not part of a political party. We're not part of a platform. Uh, we are independently funded from a group of foundations and corporations, but uh, completely independent. Uh, the, the 12 economists are very type A personalities, I can tell you that, and they will, they will say what they like. Um, and so we are speaking independently and our, our goal really is to come up with the best policy, the most practical policy options for Canadian governments across the country to do better in terms of environmental and economic performance. We care about both. I think you just answered the next question I was going to ask, which is I don't often hear people in conversation talk about how their lives are going from an eco-fiscal point of view. So do you want to just... Um you want to just define what you mean when you call sure, an eco-fiscal sure. Well, commission? you should start these conversations the next time you're at a dinner party. <laughs> I think I'm having one right uh, now. Anyway. <laughs> so it, it's in terms of better uh, environmental performance. I mean, there are, in our first report that came out when we launched in November, there are many measures uh, by which Canada doesn't do as well as, as some comparator countries. And in terms of economic performance, uh, in terms of innovation particularly, and productivity growth, we don't do as well as other countries. And I think if you look carefully at redesigning policies, you can actually do better in both. You've got this group of eclectic people who have come together for this purpose, but if you don't have kind of the good housekeeping seal of approval from some government that's created you, or you d why should people pay attention to what you're doing, I guess, is the that's question. That's a great question. Um, and we think that an important part of the message is the messengers. So we are economists first and foremost, and so if a group of 12 economists who are not always known for their ability to come to a consensus. If 12 economists from across the country who are very policy experienced can actually come to a consensus and say, this is good, these policies would be good for our economy and good for our environment, um, then we're hoping that people will listen to that and, and that the credibility really comes in who these individuals are. And the advisory board, uh, you know, is really a group of exceptional Canadians. You've listed them. They're exceptional from across the political platform, uh, spectrum, uh, from business, from civil society. Uh, and, and that uh, group of people helps us convince Canadians that this is really something that all Canadians can get behind. It's not a right or left issue. It's not a business or labor issue. It's not an east or west issue. It's good, sensible, practical, 
middle of the road policy. A couple more questions as we do a sort of a primer on what you yeah. guys are all about. Uh, I hear this expression all the time, we've got to put a price on carbon. When people say that, what do they mean? What we mean is um, taking account of the fact that every time we pollute, and whether we're talking about you know, water pollution or carbon emissions or residential garbage or other things, um, we are imposing costs on everybody. We are each of us, indi as individuals and as firms, imposing costs on everybody. Um, and if we actually price those costs in to prices, um, then, then the market will actually do a better job. So economists know that, and they will, they will wax eloquent about uh, the power of the market to allocate resources. But the market makes mistakes if it's missing a bunch of costs. So by pricing in those costs, we can actually improve the quality of market signals. Economists talk about Adam Smith and Adam Smith's invisible hand in terms of resource allocation. Well, sometimes the invisible hand needs a manicure. And the manicure here is adjusting fiscal policy in a way that can actually improve those market signals. You've also heard people say that pricing carbon is a tax increase by another name, that it's just a disguise for a tax increase. And so I have heard your commission talk about the need to have your program be revenue neutral. Explain what that means. So when you attach a price to pollution, you're going to increase the price of things that pollute. And, and, and the clear uh, economics 101 argument here is that by, changing, by raising the price on polluting activities, you'll create an incentive to reduce pollution. And you also create incentives to come up with innovative ways to reduce pollution. But the second part of eco-fiscal policies is the underappreciated part. The second part is, well, when you generate revenues from these policies, what do you do with the revenues? And there's, here there's a lot of options with what we call recycling the revenues. You can take the BC approach, which is to reduce personal and corporate taxes. You can use the Alberta approach, which is to put that money into technological development. You can use the Quebec approach, uh, which actually uses kind of a, a balanced portfolio of ways to actually promote uh, emissions reductions and, and, other, uh, and other green things, if you like. Um, but different governments have different options in, in terms of how they recycle those revenues. And so you've got to think about these policies as both halves. There's the pricing of the pollution and then the very uh, important and underappreciated part of recycling those revenues to generate further economic benefits. Okay, with that, thank you. With that background now in place, let's, uh, Sheldon, if we can bring up a couple of charts which will describe where we're at in this country right now on these issues that we've been talking about. For example, in 2005, Canada produced 736 megatons of greenhouse gas emissions. Our 2020 target aimed to reduce that by 17% to 611 megatons. Environment Canada says we are on track to produce 727 megatons of GHG emissions in 2020. In other words, 20% above the target. That's the national picture. Let's take a look at the provincial picture. British Columbia was just mentioned. It is projected to be 27 megatons above its 2020 target. Plus 27 megatons as well for Alberta. Ontario on track to be 20 megatons above the target and plus 13 megatons for Quebec. The only province apparently on track to meet and beat its target is Nova Scotia, which is minus two in the megaton department. Okay, with all of that, let's get into this. Uh, Celine, to you first. Do we need to start pricing carbon in this country? Yes, we absolutely do. Um, and I think we need to do it in a way which um, can make uh, various connections in the economy. So to the extent that we have solutions that can uh, reduce carbon emissions, uh, whether that's in energy efficiency uh, for the buildings that we work and live in, whether that's for uh, the cars that we use to, to move around or the public transportation that we could use as an alternative, uh, we absolutely do need to um, price carbon. Um, it, it, it provides an opportunity for uh, us to you know, meet our international obligations um, to actually fulfill those uh, those promises that we've made and to make sure that Canada does its share um, in terms of our contribution to reducing carbon. Let's get a view from out west. Kenneth Green, do we need to start pricing carbon in this country? I don't think so. Um, you have to ask yourself a question, which is, when virtually everyone is missing the target, what's the problem? Is the problem perhaps with the target as opposed to the people trying to meet it? So we need to reconsider the question of whether or not these targets are reasonably achievable. But, you know, uh, Pricing is a good mechanism for controlling pollution. There, there's been many studies on that, but it's not a universal tool. And it may be the most efficient way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions compared to other approaches, 
But it's also the most efficient way to a super low energy lifestyle that frankly, Canadians have not shown any inclination to adopt voluntarily without being penalized into it. Most Canadians have not chosen to adopt these kinds of lifestyles. So, uh, and when you add on to the fact that it'll have little or no environmental benefit because Canada is such a small uh, emitter on the global scheme and China and India have not even agreed to, um, to limit their emissions for many years to come. So when you, when you add those things up, I don't think the time is right to layer yet another carbon tax on the economy. We already have multiple carbon taxes in the terms of your appliance efficiency standards, your housing energy standards, your vehicle energy standards. Uh, I don't think it's the time to layer on yet another tax. And uh, one last point, which is not all taxes are created equal. Uh, so you can recycle the revenue, but unless you do it in a particularly textbook perfect way, it will put a drag on the economy and it will make Canadians, Canada less competitive internationally. Okay, a whole lot of points there that we need to pick apart. Peter Victor, let me start with the first thing Ken said in that answer, which is he did not believe that the targets that we have set over the past 25 years or so are particularly achievable. Is he right about that? No, I don't think he's right about that at all. Okay. I think, well, I think that the targets have always been set on the rather conservative side, rather modest, uh, because they're set as a result of a process of negotiation where uh, a range of interests come into play. Uh, I think that as we've gone through the last 20 years, we've learned more and more about the significance and the seriousness of climate change as a problem, and that even meeting those targets uh, is not going to wrestle that problem to the ground. And we've lost our place in the international community as a leader on environment because we're just not keeping up with the pack. If the targets are so modest, how come we can't hit them? I think we can hit them. But well, we're not I, hitting them. Well, we haven't introduced the right policies up to now, and that's why the proposal for a price on carbon, I think, is particularly attractive. Can it be good for the economy to price carbon? Well, you know, it depends on what you mean by good for the economy. I come at this a little differently from many other economists. What's the economy good for is, where I, is the question I want to ask. And the economy has to be good for employment and for security and for giving people a, a good standard of living. Uh, and that doesn't always result in endless economic growth, or let's put it differently, we don't need endless economic growth to, to satisfy those important uh, outcomes. So I think a carbon price can definitely be good for the economy in terms of increasing our overall well-being, absolutely. Chris, I saw you jotting something down there. You want to share with the rest of the class? Well, your question is, you know, can a carbon price be good for the economy? When you ask an economist that question, the, the answer is almost certainly going to be, and it will be right now, relative to what? And here's where I'm going to agree with Kim is that Ken said that you know, pollution pricing is probably better than the alternatives. So if you look at those targets that you know, every country, and I'll think about the provincial targets, right? Eight out of the 10 provinces are going to miss their 2020 targets. So what that says is if they really want to achieve those targets, they need more policy. And if they want more policy, they've got basically two choices. You can use some sort of a regulatory approach which tends to be fairly intrusive and prescriptive about what firms need to do. Or you can use a market-based measure that has pricing at its core. And a central message of our report is that province by province in this country, there are big economic advantages to using the carbon pricing approach rather than a regulatory approach. And I'll just give you the number that for Canada overall, the number is 3.7% of national income, that's GDP, in 2020. That's a big number. You know that we just went through a recession a few years ago. It was GDP fell by about 3.3%, lasted for a couple of years. This is 3.7% as a permanent benefit for using carbon pricing rather than a regulatory approach to achieve those targets. Ken, if that's the case, why are you opposed? Well, because we're not doing any rathering. Uh, we're doing additional. So we, th there are some people discussing this in the States as well, which is the idea of a grand carbon tax swap, where you put a price on carbon, but you also remove the regulations that are redundant. You remove the regulations that, and subsidies that are aimed at reducing carbon emissions. Let's not forget, we're all talking about greenhouse gas emissions right now. Conventional pollution has been a tremendous success story in Canada uh, in terms of reducing our, tradi our traditional impacts on the environment. But we're not getting any rathers. We're just getting extras. So it's, it's more and more on top. And in fact, environmentalists are already arguing that the tax to be effective will have to be much, much higher than the $30 it is today in British Columbia in order to get people to change their behavior. And uh, Ross McKittrick, a senior fellow at our institute, found the same thing when he looked at the question of what would it take to just get motorists to reduce their, gas, their gasoline consumption by 30%. Uh, and it took more than a dollar and a half per liter. Uh, to get them off of, to, to move away from using gasoline. So um, we're not seeing a, a nice, neat tax reform proposal. 
we're seeing a tax on top proposal. Well, let me pick that up with Sunny. You, you had a, you're part of a big meeting at Queen's Park the other day, right? All sorts of people, Minister of the Environment and Climate Change and lots of other experts. Did you emerge from that meeting with a sense that this is a group that is looking at rathers as opposed to extras? Uh, well, I think the, one of the defining characteristics of this problem that we're talking about today is that it, it requires us to make connections across different areas. So the people who are responsible for uh, pollution need to uh, talk to the people who are responsible for the economy and for trade. And the people who are responsible for trade need to talk to the people who are responsible for, for uh, you know, other areas like the stewardship of our forests. And so it makes for a, a, a complicated process. And it's, it's actually one of the things that the minister said is that he has responsibility to help Ontario uh, achieve its uh, greenhouse gas reduction targets, but is dependent on all of his cabinet colleagues to do that. That's the meeting um, you had the other day, I guess. That's right. Everybody to, showed up. To bring people together to start having that conversation. Now, obviously, we, we need to uh, be smart about making uh, recommendations where it, it falls within the bailiwick of a minister wherever we can. But I think this is one of the one of the big challenges that we face in renewing Canada's economy and in reducing this false choice between the economy and the environment. And that is to make the connections between the policy silos, which frankly is not something that we're very good at or very practiced at. Well, one of the reasons we're talking about this on this program tonight, of course, is that the Ontario government says it's on the verge of announcing something big. And uh, we don't know all the details of it yet, but it's probably a cap and trade system, uh, probably not a carbon tax like the uh, province of British Columbia implemented seven years ago. I want to play a little clip here. This is Gord Miller, who's the outgoing environmental commissioner of Ontario. He's got another, another month or two on the job. And he talked about the BC carbon tax approach. Ken, you just referred to it a second ago. $30 per ton of carbon is charged. Whether that's doing the job to reduce pollution, here's what Gord Miller had to say on that. Roll it, please. Carbon tax is, is a good thing when they do like we did, like they did in British Columbia, which is you, take, you, you tax the things that emit bad stuff in the atmosphere and you give the money back to the people, which British Columbia has done. And that's why they have had a, one of the most successful carbon taxes certainly on the continent, if not the world, uh, because the money goes back, and then people know it goes back because it comes back directly on, on lowering their tax bill. Chris, has the BC carbon tax example been successful in your view? Uh, yes, and in a couple of ways. So uh, number one is, you know, it was introduced in 2008 uh, at a fairly low price, and it has ramped up a little bit. Uh, it's now $30 a ton. Uh, the evidence that I've seen has suggested that per capita fuel use, it, it applies to fuels, about seven different fuels, six perhaps, um, that per capita fuel use, and this is a province that's growing by about 1% a year, so it's appropriate to look at per capita data, the per capita fuel use has fallen significantly relative to that in the rest of the country um, where carbon prices weren't used, uh, and at the same time, GDP per capita has basically tracked. So, and, and, and as tracked, meaning it is tracked, sorry, tracked the, the performance in the rest of the country. Okay. So, so no obvious uh, impact on GDP growth, but a, a clear suggestion that, that emissions have fallen per capita. Uh, and as, as the Gord Miller suggested, that this was legislatively designed to be revenue neutral. So every penny of, of revenue raised through the carbon tax was returned. They chose that recycling method to return it through corporate and personal uh, tax deductions. So Ken Green, that's two thumbs up so far. One from Gord Miller, one from Chris Reagan on the BC carbon tax. You're out there. Do you agree that it's working well? Well, I, I will say it's the closest to a textbook design carbon tax that would minimize economic harm that has been implemented that I know of anywhere around the world. Uh, but the, the issue is we have very little data, there's a lot of noise, the amount of shifting in the, in the uh, fuel use and in the economy are small numbers compared to the overall economy. So it's early to be making really strong claims about the BC carbon tax. And we'll never be able to prove the counterfactual, which is, we just, we just heard Chris said, you know, and the, the, the GDP, the economy tracked with the others. Well, how do we know it wouldn't have been higher than the others if you hadn't had the tax? Right? So we'll never be able to measure that. We can't measure the counterfactual as to what's being possibly lost in the economy. All you can say is it's not driving Canada below the average, driving uh, British Columbia, I'm sorry, below the average for Canada. Um, and one of the things we heard earlier I wanted to get back to, I hope we'll get back to it, is somebody mentioned that, well, we don't actually have to live in a world of economic growth. And 
I think it's an interesting area we could explore because if we're living in a world of population growth, that just means, and we're not going to have economic growth, it's going to mean parsing the pie, a, a static pie, instead of a growing one. And I don't know that people really want to go there. Okay, Peter Victor made that point a few minutes ago. Do you want to come back on that? Well, there's so many points I want to come back on. The first <laughs> one I want to come back on is actually a point that, that Chris made. He, he talked about these policy choices being either or. I think that's a mistake. I think we need a, a full range of policy instruments to address climate change. And so I support a carbon price in addition to many of the other measures. Uh, and there are good reasons for that. One is there are many things that a carbon price will not do very well for us. For example, we need to redesign the structure of our cities, make them more compact. Uh, it, a carbon price is a very clumsy way to do that. It's much better to do that through better, through better planning. Um, and so uh, it, it, uh, the other thing I would say is this, that the more effective a carbon price is depends upon the alternatives people have. Mm. So if, if you want a carbon price to encourage people to move to public transit, well, there's got to be the transit in place. Uh, that's not going to happen simply because you put a carbon price on. It happens through additional complementary government policy. So what I'm interested in is a comprehensive approach to dealing with climate change, and I think a carbon price is a very important part of that. Do you see the elements of a comprehensive approach in the province of Ontario? I mean, I look at some of the things on your checklist. There is a $130 billion infrastructure program the government of Ontario has announced. They're about to announce, we're told, a cap-and-trade program similar to Quebec's. Uh, we're hearing also that uh, densification is the way to go when it comes to rebuilding our cities. Uh, yeah. Well, I read like the government's uh, recent paper, and I think that's not a bad characterization of it. I think they're trying very hard to look at, it, look at this in a comprehensive way. And don't forget, Ontario was the first jurisdiction to close down its coal-fired uh, generating plants, which right. has been a, a, a big boon to Canada in terms of reducing our total emissions um, compared with what they would have been. So yes, I think Ontario is now getting onto the right track. I'm very glad to say that. Can I agree with Peter in his disagreement of me? <laughs> um, so uh, one of the important points that we make in our report is that um, carbon pricing is not the be all and the end all. There's no suggestion here that carbon pricing is the only thing we need. There are some regulations that are actually very useful. And when you start talking about redesigning cities in a way that is more sustainable, I mean, carbon price is not, um, is not the only thing you need. But I don't know any economist, frankly, who doesn't think that carbon pricing in some form is an essential part of an overall coherent policy package. And I want to come back to something that Ken said, because Ken and I would agree on this as well, is that um, you know, once a carbon price is in place, there probably is scope for rolling back or even repealing some regulations. Not all, but there are some regulations that are not very effective. Um, and you know, the Ecofiscal Commission was probably going to do a report on that in the near future. But the other thing he said is that it is that he was really speaking to the coherence of what we need in policy. You don't want to just introduce a carbon price and think you're done. Mm -hmm. You do want to think about it uh, coherently, but you also want to think about it sensibly. The details matter. So when Ontario comes out with their announcement, whatever they're going to announce in the next few weeks or few months, um, it's not enough just to have a carbon price. It's got to be designed well. And again, a very important point in the report is that the details matter. Whether you're talking about a carbon tax or a cap and trade system, you can design them very well. You can also design them poorly. Mm -hmm. And so we go through a discussion about the kinds of things you really want to focus on. I now know why you're the chair of that commission. You very skillfully managed to say, yeah, I agree with you on this, and I agree with you on this. <laughs> well played. That's good Even stuff, Chris. Even though we disagree. He, well, but he it? agrees in his disagreement yeah, with you. Well, that's uh, a move. That that's was well done. Uh, okay, well, again, we've heard, um, we keep hearing this thing over and over again, and I'm convinced most people don't know what this is. So, Cindy, you're now going to give us the, um, what is this, Ecofiscal Commission 101 vision on what um, a cap-and-trade system actually is. We're, we're seeing that numerous jurisdictions across North America are embracing these. Quebec has embraced it. I don't think people know what it is. So when you mm -hmm. talk about a cap-and-trade system, what is that? Well, uh, I can give a number of examples of cap-and-trade systems. Uh, maybe we could talk about China as an example. So uh, China uh, gave the responsibility to uh, the mayors of its larger cities to uh, count all of the large emitters of carbon in their jurisdiction. These same mayors were also responsible for actually building these, these large factories and, and, uh, and energy production systems, uh, coal power plants, among others. Um, and so uh, one counts uh, all of the emissions from these various sources and then uh, establishes how the, the, the 
degree to which the emissions will be reduced. Um, the reductions are then given uh, a, a price and uh, those uh, entities who can reduce to the degree that they're, um, they're required to don't need to buy the rights to pollute from others. Um, and uh, others may be um, different kinds of entities. They may, may be communities who have put in place uh, ways of um, using marginal agricultural land to sequester carbon. They may, may be innovation-based companies who are uh, reformulating what we put on our blue box to make automotive parts and that take uh, petroleum products out of the system. They may be very different uh, types of uh, providers of reduced CO2 emissions, um, or it may be uh, you know, one cement uh, producer who is much more efficient in reducing their carbon emissions uh, compared to another cement uh, producer, and so it may be within an industry. Okay, Chris, let me follow up with this. I own a mining company in Sudbury. As I dig for nickel, I create pollution. Under a cap and trade system, what am I gonna have to do going forward in order to live in this new reality? Great question. So uh, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to purchase some permits because uh, there's going to be tradable pollution permits that are part and parcel of a cap and trade system. Who do I get the permits from? You're going to purchase them on the market. When they're originally issued, they may be auctioned off by the government. They may be given away for free by the government, but in principle, they could be auctioned off by the government. After that, they are tradable in a market. So you simply go into the market and you buy a permit for uh, the, the amount of emissions that you want to make as part of your nickel mining operation. And there will be a price. The price is determined in the market. So just like a, ca a carbon tax system where the tax is the price per ton of emissions, now there is a market determined price per ton of emissions, which is the permit price. So if I can figure out how to get that nickel out of the ground by creating less pollution, the cost of my permits will be less and therefore my bottom line enhanced. Bingo, you'll need That's fewer permits. Fewer. You'll, you'll need fewer, fewer permits. permits. And okay. that, that's exactly the profit-driven incentive that both a carbon tax and a cap-and-trade system has. Uh, the the profit-driven incentive to actually, the market seeks out the lowest cost reduction possibilities. Um, and that is exactly why uh, carbon pricing is lower cost overall for the economy than a regulatory approach. Kenneth Green, to my knowledge, the Fraser Institute is a... Uh is an institute that likes market-based solutions. Is this a market-based solution that you can get behind? Again, um, and I, I looked at cap and trade systems in the United States. We have, there's a lot of fancy language used to describe them, um, but it tends to dance around the reality of what they are, which is essentially the government establishes a cap. That's a, a limit on the amount that can be emitted. And then they, they issue in one way or another, they either sell or they give away ration stamps, basically. And every year there are less stamps to go around. So everyone has to reduce their amounts of emissions. And if you can't do it, you have to pay somebody else to do it. Uh, but, and, and the price will continuously grow because the permits will continuously decline. And so um, the, it, it's, it's not market-based in the sense that the target is not being set ground up by consumers in a market. It's being set top down by the government that establishes a cap. Do you think that's limit. an arbitrary and way of doing it? Well, it's not so much that it's arbitrary. They'll pick some, they'll pick some not target that's related to UN targets or reduction targets. It's that th the problem is it's such a complex system that in both the United States and in Europe, we've seen tremendous failures to implement uh, cap and trade systems that, that are in any way rigorous, that are in any way um, uh, either fair or efficient. So the carbon market in, the Euro in, in, the Euro in Europe has plunged to, to, to virtually zero value repeatedly. Um, the bills proposed in the United States would have shielded favorite industries, uh, as has happened in Europe as well. Um, and no one has ever auctioned off more than a small, tiny fraction of the permits to begin with, which is critical. In fact, it's, it's essential for having a cap and trade system be uh, economically efficient and fair. Okay, Chris wants in. So that sounded to me like Ken was advocating a carbon tax over a cap and trade system. Ken, is that what you were saying? Well, yeah. If I had to pick one or the other, as in if I had to have you know, a finger cut off or a hand cut off, I'd, I'd pick the, <laughs> the smaller cut. Uh, so the carbon tax is, I will say the carbon tax is better by far than cap and trade because it's a much simpler system, which doesn't mean I would adopt it. And you'd agree that both systems are also better than a regulatory approach if your goal is to reduce emissions? Actually, you know, I wouldn't agree with that for cap and trade because there have, we've done some studies on cap and trade. I have done them in the past. 
that suggests the system is so easily distorted and so easily gamed with false permits, uh, false reductions, uh, and, and like China has successfully gamed the European trading system for billions of dollars uh, on fake uh, emission reduction credits. So I'm not really sure that cap and trade is actually better than regulation. Peter, let me get you in on this. We, we, we've, we hear two models here now, right? A carbon tax or a cap and trade system, which we all understand better now, I think. Right. Well, look, which do you prefer? Overall, I prefer a carbon tax because I agree with what some of the others have said. I think we know how to do taxes better than we do about how to create a market out of, out of nothing. But you can have a bad tax system. You could have a tax set at a, at a rate that's way too low. Uh, I don't think the $30 a ton in BC is going to solve the problem. It's been a nice step in the right direction. But I think if we're going to be using that instrument to deal with this problem, we're looking at uh, quite a, 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 a big increase in so that tax. So 30 level. per ton is too little here. Oh, it's very too little. So what and, should it be? Well, I, uh, I think we're moving up maybe 100 Dollars $100 a ton? A ton? For, to, to really have an impact. I mean, if you take into account the decline in the price of oil now, that far outweighed the, the, the value of the tax that they imposed. In. Okay, Celine, let me follow up with this. If you are the government of Ontario, which I think fears that it has a reputation of wanting to tax everything it can see. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm going out on a limb here a bit, but you know, that's, that's certainly what the criticism has been. If that's the case, are you more afraid politically of trying to convince people that a carbon tax is better for them than a cap and trade system, which doesn't sound like a tax? Well, the cap and trade system has been tried in Ontario uh, for um, the, the problem we had with sulfur pollution, which, which caused acidification of our lakes. And so we actually have people in Ontario who know how to create a cap and trade system for pollution. This is the uh, 30 years ago, the countdown yeah. acid rain That's plan? That's acid rain plan, okay. and, and which was very successful. Very successful. And it was yeah, I worked in the government in those days, and that wasn't what we did. That was a, it was a regulatory approach. It wasn't a cap and trade approach? No, that was in the U.S., where it has worked quite well in the U.S. Yeah. on sulfur dioxide. I'm sorry no, to... No, no, that's quite okay. But, it, but we do have some experience in Ontario in designing cap and trade. We use it for NOx and particulates, and it came from an initiative from Ontario Hydro back in the 1990s. Well, if I remember, it was 30 years ago, and basically the Minister of Energy threatened all the main polluters with closing them down if they didn't stop polluting. On the acid rain problem, it got pretty serious, and that was the kind yeah. of action that was and, brought in. And he wasn't bluffing, and it actually worked. Yeah. Right? Inco, yeah. Falcon Regu Bridge, regulation, Algoma. Regulation can work, and it works best when you have a pollutant that has local impacts. The problem with uh, these uh, economic instruments is that they kind of say, well, we don't care who's discharging the, the effluent or the waste uh, as long as we get the total down. That's fine for greenhouse gases. That's why I'm a strong supporter of these hmm. approaches. But it doesn't work for many, many other more local problems. Hmm. Ken, I, I heard you trying to get in. Sure. Um, what I was going to point out is that sulfur dioxide and carbon dioxide both end in dioxide, which does not make them the same chemical or amenable to the same kind of treatment methods. Sulfur dioxide was a, is a chemically active uh, chemical that there was ready off-the-shelf uh, technology to remove it from uh, coal emissions, which was primarily where it came from, coal burning emissions. There were a small number of players in the United States in one jurisdiction, one central Jewish, Jewish jurisdiction. Um, and so it, it's really not even a, a vaguely comparable to look at cap and trade systems, which again, like, carb like pricing systems, can work. I'm not saying they don't. But uh, it's inapplicable to, to compare acid rain reduction with uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction. We do not have off-the-shelf technologies ready for that. The chemical itself is inert. You have to add energy to bind it up or somehow get rid of it. Well, okay. Uh, we with, multiple for, Ken, forgive me. With time running out here, they didn't have, have off-the-shelf technology for acid rain either. They came up with it. And, but anyway, I, I want to get back to the question I asked uh, Celine a moment ago, which is, you've got to figure out how to sell this now, right? This is an idea where, and uh, I, I think it's worth mentioning here. The Globe did a survey showed, this is from the I want my cake and eat it department. 71% of Canadians support new taxes on business that emit greenhouse gases. 41% of Canadians are prepared to face new taxes on gasoline. Here's a letter to the editor in the Globe that goes like this. Cap and trade is simply an expensive carbon tax. The government sells permits and collects money. That is a tax. This business expense is paid on to the consumer. Passed on, sorry. Companies hire pricey professionals skilled at carbon trading. That cost, too, is passed on to the consumer. The government pays for oversight of cap and trade. Who do you think foots that bill? Again, getting back to this issue of how do you convince people that this medicine is good for them? Celine, 
Well, I think one of the ways is to uh, take the revenues that are derived from this system and to use them in ways that people consider to be um, visible and in the public good. And, and I think there is some value to the discussion of, you know, do we make uh, these systems, whether carbon tax or crap and trade, uh, just revenue flow through, so, so and that we don't actually use that those funds to invest in things like infrastructure, as uh, has been pointed out earlier today, which the public can actually see as being part of the solution. So if I have a GO train that's more frequently uh, running and that I can use instead of taking my car, I can therefore understand that you know we are taking the revenues that have come from uh, the cap and trade system or from the carbon tax to do something which is practical and that I can I can use and that does benefit uh, our our work to try and reduce uh, carbon emissions. Peter, how do you convince people this is good? I think it's called leadership, and I think that uh, we've got other examples in the environmental field where leadership has done the job. Uh, take the blue box for example; it didn't require. A a, a fee. It didn't require a charge. It required uh, explaining to people, if they needed explaining, that waste was a problem and we should be recycling it. And so people joined in uh, pretty quickly with that. And I think what's missing still in Ontario is a, is a broad-based understanding of how serious the problem of climate change is and how it does require a commitment from all of us, whether we're in business or uh, individuals, uh, to, to make some changes. And I think if we appreciate that, then a measure that comes in, in terms of policy and says, look, we're going to sort of give you a signal that supports the changes that you already believe in, I think it can be solved. Chris, how do you talk to the person who wrote that letter to the Globe and Mail and convince them this is not just another tax by a different name? Well, I think it's a great question and it's a great challenge. Um, I, but I, I don't think we have to convince people of one thing, is that most people actually want to make progress on this issue. That's exactly what your survey suggested. But I, I don't think they're, they, they have a clear view forward. They're not quite sure how to do this. And I think there ends up being a lot of finger pointing, is that you know we don't mind it if you tax those people or you don't mind if you tax those businesses. I think we have to understand that we are all in this together. As consumers and as producers, we are all living in a way that you know produces pollution. And we should just think about those costs. So what we need is a comprehensive way to do this. And I think, I think how this is going to affect people in, in, the, in the most important, in their living room way, comes down to what I think will be the most important debate about this, which is the revenue recycling. So when you increase the prices on energy sources and you're gonna create the incentives to, to reduce pollution and to use uh, more uh, cleaner forms of energy, all of that is good, that's the environmental benefit. But what are you gonna do with the revenues? And here I think uh, Canadians need to hold their governments to account to choose a method of recycling that's going to be good for the economy. And different uh, provinces are probably going to make different choices here. And this is why the Ecofiscal Commission has reported that the provincial approach is a very sensible approach going forward because provinces are very different. They're going to have differently designed systems as exists in Alberta and BC and Quebec. Uh, you know, BC and Quebec are both very well designed systems, but they are very differently designed. Ken, I lose my satellite in the next minute, so you can have the final minute here and tell us where you're, where are you at now on all of this? Thanks. Uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm re really with the letter writer. Uh, the reality is, if you impose a carbon price, the price of virtually everything that people use is going to go up. And it, that includes the energy that's embedded in the things that they wear, the products that they buy. Uh, prices will go up, and I don't think that you're going to be able to sell this to people by saying, well, we're reducing you somewhere else. Uh, because I think they'll, they instinctively understand that this is just, a, it's another new tax, really, and the government incentive to claw some of that back for its, its tendency to spend is, is Im implacable. Let me get my thank you in before we lose the satellite. Ken Green from the Fraser Institute Thanks. in Vancouver, British Columbia. Good of you to be with us on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. And back here great. in our Thanks. studio, Chris Reagan, Chair of the Ecofiscal Commission, Peter Victor, Professor of Environmental Studies at York University, Céline Back. CEO, Analytical Advisors. Thanks so much to the three of you as well. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.